Welcome everyone. Griffith University would like to acknowledge the Ngunnawal people who are the traditional custodians of the land upon which we meet today, pay respects to the elders past, present and emerging, and extends that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. These welcomes to country have their origin in First Nations practice, and they are intended in that original purpose and also mark the work that remains unfinished. I would like to welcome you to the first Australian Repair Summit. There are about 50 of us here present in the room today at the National Library of Canberra, and not including the excellent National Library of Canberra support staff who are helping us run this hybrid technology event. I would also like to say thank you for joining to the enormous community of people online. We have over 293 registrants remotely connected today from Australia and globally. My name is Leanne Wiseman, and I am a professor of intellectual property law and a member of the Law Futures Centre at Griffith University in Brisbane, Australia. I'm also chair of the Australian Rep Repair Summit Steering Committee, and I would like to acknowledge my steering committee colleagues, Leslie Yates of the AAAA, John Gutsakis from the E-Waste Watch, Guido Verbist, repair advocate, and the new general manager of Revolve Recycle, Karen and Dan Ellis from Mendit Australia, and Matthew Steen from Choice, who unfortunately could not be here to join us in person, but who will be joining us throughout the day today online. I want to sincerely thank our funders, the Law Futures Centre, Griffith University, Carl Wines from iFixit, and Repco, also for, for providing the financial support that has enabled this event to be held today. Both in-person and virtual attendees are able to interact today, and please feel free to make and continue those connections going forward into the future. We're using the app Slido today for all questions, and we ask that you download this um, to participate. So what is the aim of today? This full day summit provides an opportunity for interested repair stakeholders to genuinely and openly engage in discussions, relevant questions and respectful debate with government, policymakers, and industry to discuss the emerging right to repair movement. We will hear of recent repair developments in the Australian regulatory and policy landscape and um, hear about recent developments in the United States from Kyle and perspectives and experiences of repairers, consumers, manufacturers, reusers, and those in the product stewardship arena. The aim is also to encourage participants to discuss and network with each other and to provide contributions and feedback on their experiences with repair. Today is one day to engage with new knowledge and ideas which will promote your curiosity and your social connections. Ultimately, we hope to strengthen collaboration in the Australian and international repair community, but also within and across the various in industries that are impacted by repair to facilitate the building of a broader repair coalition in Australia. You may wonder who's in the room today and in the virtual room. Given repairability and the right to repair movement is a multifaceted issue touching many different legal regimes, industries and practices, Reflecting this, we have individuals and industry connections from a wide variety of sectors, from government at all levels, policymakers, manufacturers from many and varied industries, designers, environmental and sustainability practitioners, academics, and members of our broader community and society. This is an issue that has wide-reaching impact on all of us. We recognise that each of you bring links and connections with your own organisations and broader society. This is particularly important in terms of bridging the worlds of repair and reuse with design, manufacturing, IP, consumer and competition law, product stewardship and environmental sustainability. We're very excited to have such a broad and diverse group of interested repair stakeholders here today willing to have a meaningful and respectful conversation about repairability. At the end of today, we hope you have been engaged, interested and challenged and have developed new connections. 
We want to increase support for the collaboration that we need that will help us develop the roles we each play in the repair and in supporting a more sustainable environmental future for Australia. I, of course, want to thank the excellent um, lineup of speakers that we have today and thank them for their willingness to join in the discussions with each and every one of you. And thank you to also all of you for your interest and participation. Again, thanks. Today would not have happened without the support of our funders, Melanie Davis in the Law Futures Centre at Griffith University, my wonderful student Anna Sterling, who is here today, and the wonderful staff of the NLA. Please be curious, social, and ask questions of yourself to find out what the future might hold for repair in Australia. I would now like to introduce Minister Shane Rattenbury, who's the Attorney General and currently Minister for Water, Energy and Emissions Reductions, Minister for Gaming and Minister for Consumer Affairs in the ACT. Shane has been an environmental advocate for many years and it was in his role as Minister for Consumer Affairs that he really um, began to advocate for right to repair. So, Shane, I'd like to invite you to come up to speak. Thank you. Uh, Darawa Nana, Darawa Nanawal. This is Nanawal land, and I take this opportunity to acknowledge the long and continuing connection that the Nanawal people have to the land that Canberra now sits on. Uh, thank you, Leanne, for that welcome. And, Good morning, everybody. It is a real pleasure to join you and all of those online uh, for today's summit. I am really pleased to be invited to speak this morning. This is a great summit on a really important issue and one that I'm very passionate about, both as a Minister for Consumer Affairs, uh, as a Greens Member of Parliament and as an environmentalist. This is an issue that we must tackle in this country and I'm pleased to see it is starting to gain some momentum here in Australia. Now, today's summit has the very specific intent of engaging with government, policy makers and industry to cover detailed and thorny questions arising from the emergence of the right to repair movement in Australia, itself a response to ongoing, ongoing and large scale trends. And I want to really congratulate Leanne and the organising committee for putting this event together and giving us the opportunity to come together and have these conversations. People involved in this movement really are pioneers in Australia. It's at the front edge and I'm very pleased to have this moment where people can actually come together and hopefully reinforce each other's efforts to get this going in Australia. The uh, first couple of slides I've got this morning really go to you know, give you just a quick taste of how the right to repair is part of a complex and ongoing issue from around the world. Now this particular image is from a Canadian newspaper. Uh, while this Second image is from a piece from The Conversation, and it demonstrates that there is a, a discussion really going on out there, but I think it's appropriate in a speech like this to start from a much, much wider angle in order to better prepare us for zeroing in on the nitty gritty today, and perhaps even to suggest a guiding philosophical viewpoint of how we should consider this issue. But I'm actually talking about our essence as human beings. One of the universal attributes of the human species is our creativity, our inventiveness, and our ingenuity. Throughout human history and prehistory, those have been intricate, connected things, both within individuals and across cultures and societies. You only have to take a look at ancient crafts like knitting. Now, the earliest surviving pieces of knitting are several socks found in Egypt and dating to between 1000 and 1300 AD. Now, when I look at these amazing thousand year old socks, I'm struck not just by how inventive they are in a technical sense, but like who had the first idea to use a pair of needles to create these endless interlocking loops? We have no idea. How did knitting actually start? Was it someone just fiddling around with a piece of string and some sticks? And not it's also not just how practical and carefully thought out they are. With proper heel and toe shaping, you know, they're not bad for something a thousand or so years old. Uh, they've got tapering calves and fine cotton yarn. But I'm also struck by how creative and how beautiful they are in a way that's entirely superfluous to their practical function. Yet this superfluous beauty is a common factor across a vast proportion of these kinds of artefacts. 
it suggests not just that knitting these socks was probably important to their creator, but that creativity and what you might call emotional ownership is an integral part of human ingenuity. We tend to take these kinds of intricate patterns for granted now, assuming a team of sock designers and complex industrial scale machinery in a factory that probably looks something like this. But if we go back to then, it would have been an act of personal artistry combined with the practical inventiveness of knowing how to thread those different coloured strands on the inside of the sock so they didn't spoil the pattern. Now there's a whole huge explosion of creativity and invention behind these socks. Again, we don't know how long, years or decades or centuries, it took to get from those first awkward loops on two sticks that we can imagine to flat, clumsy garments to shaping and patterns like this, but it illustrates another element to the connected nature of human ingenuity. The way ideas spark from one person to the next, like batons passed in a relay, improving upon or reimagined with each pair of hands and eyes, from the first wooden wheels or simple canoes to an aircraft's retractable landing gear or a 400 metre long container ship. It is a long journey from one to the next. But there is a paradox at work in our modern civilization, thanks to thousands of years of this relay of ingenuity. Most of the stuff all of us use now, we could not make from scratch in a pink fit. We would not know where to begin. In that sense, our own inventiveness as a species has robbed us of ownership of our inventiveness as individuals. Yet surely such a fundamental human attribute as our creativity and our ingenuity and our ownership of these things has, also, has to also be considered a fundamental human right, as important for us to access as the right to air and water and shelter and food. The right to tinker with our stuff, to get it fixed or changed or improved or upgraded, made that a little bit better, a little bit more practical, to manage it how we want, to make it last as long as we can. Put simply, the right to get it repaired. Which gets us to the point we've arrived at now and the reason we have this need for this summit. It's not only the complexity of current technology that robs us individually of the kind of connection to our things and the ownership of ingenuity that I've been talking about, it's corporate behaviour and existing gaps or imbalances in our laws that we need to really think about. Now, I know for this audience, I don't need to spend a lot, of, a lot of time detailing what is happening or why it's a problem from multiple perspectives. Proprietary service manuals that make it impossible for independent repair businesses to do their work. Companies that simply don't make available the replacement parts for their products. Warranties that are voided if a consumer or independent repairer so much as unscrews a backplate on a product. As the Minister for Consumer Affairs, I've been working on this issue for a couple of years now. And as a political party, the Greens, both federally and in the ACT, have been aware of it for some time as well. Now, just now, I focused on the fundamental and rather abstract right of human beings to express and own their inventiveness. But specific consumer rights around products they've purchased are also crucial. As a matter of principle, consumers should be able to use an independent repairer or access the resources needed to repair a product themselves. Further, and very much a central concern of environmental and green groups worldwide, with our species now consuming far more of the world's resources than the planet can possibly handle, preserving resources and reducing waste have become existential needs. E-waste is the fastest growing waste stream in Australia growing three times as fast as other municipal waste. The average Australian household generates 73 kilograms of it annually, while globally the total figure is more than 50 million tonnes a year. We're not disposing of it properly, and we're squandering resources, whether it be lithium, tellurium, copper. These resources are finite and should be valued far more than the simple act of putting them into a product that we use for a little while until the next coolest one comes along or until we can't repair it anymore because of the built-in obsolescence. The deliberate shortening of a product's lifespan, this planned obsolescence, 
by refusing to supply component parts or discontinuing software updates needs to be countered. Companies and manufacturers might like it. Ordinary people hate it, however. They want to purchase a washing machine or a laptop or a phone or whatever the product is, knowing it will last many years and it should be able to be repaired. I think consumers have that basic expectation. Certainly our parents and our grandparents did. The growth of grassroots efforts such as repair cafes speaks to our hunger to move away from the throwaway culture that commercial interests have pushed us towards. The Bower, a registered charity committed to reuse and repair, now has four locations in Sydney and a whole range of activities from donation and a collection service to repair cafes, an e-tool library and a tiny house building course focused on using recycled and reclaimed materials extending the lifespan of all sorts of things in lots of inspiring ways. I mean, for me, I think the most inspiring part of this is the creativity, bringing us back to that central point. We have seen some egregious conduct at the corporate level. <clears throat> As of February this year, American company John Deere was still failing to honour its agreement to voluntarily make its repair tools, software guides and diagnostic equipment available to ordinary farmers. Can you imagine being a farmer in the middle of your harvest? You've, your harvester breaks down. You've got that time window to get your crops in. And you have to wait for the service person to come out from somewhere a long way away when they're available and everybody else is needing it at the same time. It's simply not a tenable situation, one that we must turn around. The push for the right to repair is no longer simply happening at the grassroots level, however. Uh, government recognition of the problem, I think, is starting to build. Last month, in what was an excellent piece of timing as far as this summit goes, the Productivity Commission report was released. And I know we're going to hear from them later today, and I'm very pleased to have members from the Productivity Commission team here today. But their draft report assesses the need for the right to repair laws in Australia with, and I quote, a focus on whether consumers face any unnecessary barriers to repair that require a government policy response. The short answer, of course, is that most of us here today think they do face those barriers and a government policy response is required. The perspective of manufacturers does need to be considered, of course, but we also need to be a bit cynical when there's a push from certain companies to treat this purely as a matter of security and IP protection when in fact, to a large degree, I believe their motivation is rent seeking. We also have justification for being cynical about corporations that promise to police themselves. I'm not going to name any particular companies, but there have been examples of those voluntarily undertaking to make software and repair manuals available, and then arguing that this undertaking meant that rights repair legislation was unnecessary. We'll take care of it, they tell us. Years later, the problem continues, and we can see that these companies were simply kicking the can down the road. In the ACT, we're already a little bit ahead of the Productivity Commission's report in our own thinking. In fact, I'm quite pleased that our small jurisdiction is the one that has pushed this along, including the pre precipitating the Commission's report. Uh, we took a paper to the meeting of Consumer Affairs Ministers in 2019, arguing that the right to repair was an emerging issue that Australia needed to be looking at. And we got agreement from the other ministers for consumer affairs, from all the other Australian jurisdictions, uh, to seek to refer this to the Productivity Commission. Uh, and that was the forum's recommended outcome. I was really pleased that the paper we put forward and made the case of why this was so necessary got the support of other jurisdictions and has led to uh, this process getting underway. Now, this is only a draft report from the Productivity Commission. That's how they do things, as they'll no doubt explain later. And I'm sure you're aware that there is an opportunity to make submissions towards the report's final version. Now, for anyone who doesn't know, the deadline for this is the 23rd of July, so it's only two weeks away. But I'd like to think that the couple of hundred people who are online today and in the room uh, would be taking the time to have a look at that. It's quite a thick report, but there's a good executive summary. Uh, but I'd really urge you to put your voice forward because through that process, uh, we can help drive this along. The report rightly notes the complexity of these issues and the need to balance conflicting interests. I do urge you 
uh, to make that submission because there are quite a few facets to this report. Uh, here in the ACT, we already have new initiatives ready to launch as a result of the work we've done to date. As I said, we're a little ahead of the Productivity Commission. In August, uh, consistent with the con Commission's recommendation, our new enforceable conciliation will commence. Uh, this gives my Consumer Affairs Agency the out, the, empowers them, gives them the power to require a company to come in and meet with a consumer and come up with an agreed outcome uh, that can be enforced. Uh, it actually, I think, does, it goes a long way to re rebalancing some of the imbalances that exist between corporates and consumers. Uh, it kicks off in about six weeks' time, and I'm going to be very interested to see how it goes, but we think this is a really important initiative. Now, on its own, this is a positive outcome. And if it can be supported by new legislation, such as the Productivity Commission's recommendations for a super compliant mechanism, and for the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission to develop and publish estimates for how long certain products can reasonably be expected to last, in other words, pushing back on planned obsolescence, it should become a powerful tool for consumers and consumer advocacy groups. One of the most significant areas that needs the appropriate balance is the current clash between intellectual property rights and the right of consumers and independent repairers to access repair information. On the one hand, manufacturers consider some of this information to be proprietary in nature, and making it more accessible could impact on the willingness of companies to invest in innovation, particularly in areas such as video and online gaming. In some areas, there can also be safety and other concerns resulting from the use of information by unskilled repairers. However, there surely needs to be some kind of positive obligation on manufacturers to make repair supplies and information available to third parties. The Commission is specifically calling for input on this concept of positive obligation. Funnily enough, uh, Leanne and I were both interviewed by the press just before the conference started. One of the journalists said to me, well, what do you think about these safety issues? You know, what, what if some person just opens something up and repairs it? And I thought it was a really interesting question because it spoke to this, I guess, the way the world is seen now and this notion of risk, the idea that somehow individuals are not capable of developing the skills to repair something in a safe way. My response was, well, frankly, if there are parts are made available and the skills are shared and the knowledge is shared, it won't take long for people to become very skilled in making those repairs. But I think that is reflective of where the debate is at and the questions that we need to, to address. When it comes to... Um, sorry, the other point I was going to make about the Productivity Commission report is there also needs to be an overhaul of the language used in warranty agreements to prevent a warranty being voided, or in some cases to prevent the consumer from wrongly believing that the warranty will be voided. And this is certainly an issue in consumer law, is what you're, you actually are entitled to versus what you think you're entitled to. Uh, with regard to e-waste, e -waste, various Australian governments have addressed concerns through product stewardship schemes, such as the National Television and Computer Recycling Scheme, or the NTCRS. As the situation stands, however, there is little incentive for these schemes to do anything other than recycle collected e-waste. This is resulting in otherwise functional products being dismantled and destroyed for their component materials, rather than being put to higher value uses through repair and resale. The Commission is seeking evidence on whether product labelling standards would provide net benefits to the community and how the government and industry might jointly approach such a scheme. The Commission has also recommended that the Australian Government should amend the NTCRS to include repair and reuse as an option. Now, I think the Productivity Commission has done good work, and I genuinely thank them for the ongoing effort on this really important and potentially transformative issue. However, I will make one additional, and I think particularly important, comment about their draft report and their current recommendations. That is the fact that their analysis and recommendations seem quite focused on the end product and potential solutions for consumers at the end of the line. That is, what can a consumer do when, they're in, when they inevitably have a product that lacks the longevity or transparency that they deserve? Now that's fine, and I think these are important areas of evolution, 
but how can we change this paradigm of consumers receiving such products in the first place? How can we stop manufacturers making products that leave the onus on the consumers to seek end of the line solutions? I would like to see much more work and more focus on the beginning of the production line, not the end. What obligations should we be placing on the producers of the things we use to meet certain standards before they can be sold, imported, manufactured in Australia? Standards around transparency and repairability, qualities that should just be a default for consumers. Of course, it's a thorny area in this free market world that we live in these days, but I think that manufacturers need further scrutiny, uh, seemingly an inevitable, sorry, they need more further scrutiny and I think undoubtedly more regulation because I don't believe that they're going to go down this path voluntarily. And I think it is upon us to address this. One of the key tasks of governments in my mind is to address market failure. And this is clearly a market failure that requires an active intervention. I don't think manufacturers out of the goodness of their own hearts are going to make these changes. And so I hope that this, it's certainly a point that I intend to put in the ACT government submission to the Productivity Commission. And I think that is a point that uh, I would, I hope that others will give that feedback uh, and we might see uh, some different comments or further content when the Productivity Commission's final report comes out uh, because these are issues that have been identified in campaigns around the world. We are seeing these sort of moves in the European market and I think it's the sort of moves we need to see here in the Australian market for products like, whether it's farm equipment, right through the electronic goods that we all purchase on a regular basis. Let me conclude by circling back to where I started, the socks. It is easy in this kind of area to get lost in the niceties of corporate responsibility and consumer legislation. And that's quite important. In fact, it's a key part of my job. But as we work on these things today and in the future, let's try to remember when we can this broader idea that human ingenuity is an essential part of our nature. Uh, and as this slide lovely, in a lovely way shows, uh, human beings are, have a great sense of ingenuity. I think they have a right to express it and to use it. And it can be very clever in the way that it uh, ensures that we make the most of the very valuable resources we have on this planet. I think if we reflect on that, it will help us to navigate this space more thoughtfully and come up with solutions that work. I do wish everyone great success at the summit today. Uh, thank you again, Leanne and the team for putting it together. This is an important moment in Australian consumer activism, in environmental activism to drive forward this very important agenda in this country. Enjoy the summit today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shane, for those insightful and reflective comments. It's an excellent way to start today. I just have a small gift. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate we now um, turn to um, an online presentation in this true hybrid um, fashion that we have today. Um, and we welcome Carl Wines from iFixit in the United States. He has done a pre-recording uh, message. He is one of our funders and very keen supporters of the right to repair movement. Um, he has done a pre-recorded presentation today, um, but will be available for question and answer following his presentation. So um, over to you, Carl. Thank you very much. Hello, I am so excited to be here. I wish I was joining you in person. Unfortunately, flight restrictions, just not quite there yet. The world is reopening, uh, and I look forward to joining all of you in person soon. Uh, I'm Kyle. I started iFixit. I thought I'd give you a little bit of, of my background, iFixit's background, and then I'm going to walk you through what's happening with Right to Repair uh, in the U.S., because uh, there has been a, a lot happening, even as, as recently as this morning. Uh, there's a lot of activity happening. Uh, but I got into this, I actually, my first job when I was in high school was repairing Apple computers. Uh, I got a job at a local Apple authorized service center, so they were doing warranty work on Apple devices when I was 14, and I've been in the industry ever since. Uh, I started iFixit when I was studying at university, and I was trying to fix my own computer, uh, and I had trouble working on it. And uh, the reason that I had trouble was that I didn't have access to the service manuals that Apple uh, that I had access to when I was working for an Apple authorized service center. 
it turned out that Apple had sent copyright threats to anyone that posted their service manuals online and had wiped that knowledge from the internet. And as someone who is young and idealistic, who believes in the power and freedom of information, that really kind of rankled me. And so I decided that I would write my own service manual to replace the information that Apple had taken offline. Uh, we've been doing that ever since. I fix it has helped hundreds of millions of people around the world learn how to repair not just their Apple products, but products across the board. Uh, and, and one of the main reasons that we do this, of course, it's beneficial for consumers if they can fix, fix things. It's beneficial for the local economy, but it's also really essential uh, for the environment. These, these electronics that we have are some of the most carbon intensive products that we, we have. If, we, if everyone in the United States was to use their phone for just a year longer, it would be the equivalent of taking 600,000 vehicles off the road. Uh, and almost all the emissions during the lifespan of, of a cell phone is not from you plugging in and charging it off the wall. It's all embodied at the time of manufacture. It takes a huge amount of raw materials, uh, fresh water, carbon, uh, raw materials dug out of the ground to make one of these things. Uh, and so if we are going to go all that effort of making it, let's make things last as long as possible. And of course, I know I am preaching to the choir. That's why all of you are here. <laughs> Uh, so let's dive in and talk about some of the obstacles that we've seen manufacturers throw up. Of course, there's the service manual problem. And I know Tim Hicks is here and will be speaking later this afternoon. Uh, back when Tim got his uh, takedown notice from Toshiba, Australia, you know, he was running this amazing website sharing service manuals with everyone. Toshiba says, no, those are our, authorized, those are our copyright service manuals. They're only available to our authorized technicians. Well, now we're seeing manufacturers go beyond just the service manuals. They lock down access to parts. Apple, for example, won't sell anyone a battery for your phone. Samsung has special diagnostic software tooling for working on their smartphones that they don't make available to anyone else. John Deere has special software that their technicians have that they won't make available to farmers. So across the board, we see all kinds of these obstacles that manufacturers are throwing up there. Access to parts, access to tools, access to information, the ability to pair parts. Um, trademark issues, patent issues. I mean, the, the entire intellectual property regulatory regime is designed to protect creators, unfortunately, at the same time as electronics are making it into more and more products, they're interfering with all of our ownership rights. You know, we have the things that we traditionally think that we can do with property. If it's mine, I bought it, I paid for it, I should be able to do whatever I want. Well, manufacturers have found ways of using the intellectual property laws that were designed to pr protect creators, uh, creatives, uh, they're using that to, uh, to eliminate competition in the repair market. And we've seen the harms that it has, has done in our communities. There used to be cam a camera shop in just about every uh, city in the world, and now there are very, very few. Well, that's because Nikon and Canon decided to cut off support to independent uh, uh, camera shops, including access to repair information. As, as I talk with consumers and I ask them, hey, you know, would you be, you've got your thing that's broken, would you be interested in repairing it? One of the major uh, things that I hear from consumers that has always been sort of interesting is a psychological barrier around warranties. I say, hey, your phone is broken. Why don't you open it up and fix it yourself? And they'll say, well, what about the warranty? Won't I be voiding my warranty if I do that? Uh, and I find this absolutely fascinating for a few reasons. One, uh, it's already broken. If, if the warranty really mattered, wouldn't you just have already taken it to the manufacturer? Two, where is this idea coming from? Like it has completely uh, pervaded our society, this, this idea that warranties, uh, you'll void your warranty if you work on your product. And I realize this is a country by country uh, situation, but it just so happens in the United States, it's not legal to do that. Uh, it's not legal for manufacturers to void the warranty, uh, but consumers think that anyway. And the reason is these warranty voided for move stickers that are in products across the board. Uh, and I, yeah, it, it feels like they've been added to more and more products. Well, in the U.S., the Federal Trade Commission has started taking action on this. They sent notice to Microsoft, Nintendo, and Sony telling them to knock it off, stop putting those warranty void for move stickers off products. And earlier this year, the Federal Trade Commission launched a website, reportfraud.ftc.gov, and they said that those warranty void for move stickers are actual fraud. Uh, so that's the, the kind of thing that maybe consumer organizations around the world uh, you know, and governments could get involved with pushing back on, on manufacturer practices like that. And it's, it's, it's a psychological barrier that, that gets people to think, oh, I can't open anything. I have to take it to an authorized center. The manufacturers want you to go to them for permission to do everything, and that's not the way the world works. If they wanted permission for everything that you were going to do uh, with the product, they shouldn't have sold it to you in the first place. They sold it to me. It's mine. I can do what I want with it. I can fix it if I want. I can break it if I want. I can paint it purple if I want. It's mine. 
If, if they wanted a, you know, to, to restrict me from doing it, they shouldn't have sold me that product in the first place. And it's nice to see the U.S. Federal Trade Commission get more and more involved in this. We have heard a number of arguments from manufacturers opposing right to repair, and, and the, the U.S. Federal Trade Commission recently released a report called Nixing the Fix, where they went through and they systematically analyzed those manufacturer obstacles. Uh, and I can, I can talk through all of them ad nauseum with you, but it's everything from cybersecurity to safety issues. Uh, and what, what the FTC found at the end of this exhaustive multi-year process was that there was no substantive data backing up any of the manufacturer arguments against repair. Uh, it, it turns out, I mean, and it, this has kind of been clear to uh, those of us working on the issue from the beginning, um, that these are all excuses. The real reason is we have a monopoly. It's very profitable for us. We'd like to continue having that monopoly. Uh, and we have to step back and say, is it in society's best interest for every manufacturer to have a monopoly on service of their devices? Uh, probably not. And 27 different U.S. states agree. Uh, so you know, in the U.S. broken up, we have, we're a... Uh, <laughs> A lot of different states, every state runs their own legislative process separately. Um, and, and we kind of have two tracks of policy that we're working on in the US. We have state level legislation and federal leg legislation. At the state level, what we're working on doing is addressing the competition, access to parts, tools, and information. And so the state right to repair bills, based on the model uh, bill put out by the Repair Association, uh, basically says, hey, if a manufacturer has a repair network, they need to make available the same parts, tools, and information. Uh, to independent repair shops and consumers that they make available to their repair network. Uh, those state bills are making progress. None of them have passed so far this year. Uh, New York passed it in the Senate, but then failed to get it through the assembly in time. The state of Arkansas introduced a hospital-focused uh, bill that also passed the Senate in Arkansas, didn't make it all the way through. There are a number of US states that are still active, so it's a possibility later this year uh, that one could pass. Increasingly, there's, you know, when 27 different states are working on, on, it, on something, it tends to raise it to prominence at the federal level. And so the uh, President Biden's administration has announced that they are uh, going to re release an executive order asking the Federal Trade Commission to do a rulemaking where the Federal Trade Commission can put in practice rules uh, that govern get trade. One example of a rule that they have is if you put made in America on a product, it has to be made in the USA. Well, we don't necessarily have laws on the books to enforce that. Instead, the Federal Trade Commission has, has introduced rules and they have the power from Congress to enforce those rules. So the Biden administration has asked the Federal Trade Commission to do something similar around right to repair. It will be very interesting to see where that goes. They specifically singled out smartphones and farm equipment uh, for the FTC to look at. But you can imagine that will capture a number of other uh, industries. In addition to what's happening in the US, uh, we also have a lot of momentum happening around the world. Uh, the European Commission has already passed some lightweight right to repair uh, regulations around appliances, and they're looking to expand that to smartphones and other in the future. France has rolled out repairability scoring where, where laptops, smartphones, and other products have to have a score from one to 10 on how easy it is to fix something. That score factors in availability of parts uh, and availability of service information. So you have Samsung has now released service manuals for many of their flagship smartphones in French. Uh, they have not released those uh, in uh, American or Australian yet. <laughs> uh, but we will see, we're, we're, we're hoping, and it will be nice to see other countries adopt the French approach. Also, Canada is, is working on, on uh, fixes, specifically fixes to the anti-circumvention provisions uh, that we've seen in copyright acts around the world. Uh, and all of you are going to be talking today about what's happening in Australia. So I just want to say welcome to the global movement. Uh, this is something that is greater than any one uh, country or jurisdiction. Uh, all of these manufacturers are making and selling and distributing these products globally. All of us are using them around the world. We would like to be able to fix them. And I'm optimistic that if all of us can come together, we can find some common sense solutions uh, that will, that will uh, advance consumer rights in Australia. Thank you very much. Have a great event. event. Um, thank you, Kyle. Um, thank you so much. It, it's um, great to have you involved in it. Fantastic to have you speak to us today, but also to um, support our Repair Summit. So, Kyle, um, there you are. It's great to see you. Thank you. Um, you. Uh, hi. Hi. <laughs> you can see us. Yes. Great. Um, Shane is here Absolutely. too. So we um, we in we've got Kyle and Shane. I'm um, happy to take questions. And as I suggested at the start, we are using Slido um, for COVID reasons. So if anyone has any questions, um, I'm 
more than happy to take questions from the audience, obviously, here as well. We have, um, you've got the ability to speak as well. Um, I've got a couple of questions here. Um, is there or does there need, so this is from Ken, is there or does there need to be a distinction between a consumer agricultural and a commercial right to repair? And that can either be to Kyle or perhaps Shane. <laughs> Well, maybe I'll, I'll answer first, but then pass it off to Shane, because I think this is kind of a question of what is good policy. I, I am concerned that we tend to like address these things in isolation. It's much better to uh, ad address these issues I mean, in, in, in principle across the board. I don't see a fundamental difference between a farmer having access to the, the information that he needs to repair a tractor and a consumer having access to the information that they need to replace the phone. What we tend to see is that the intellectual property laws uh, that are preventing access to repair are the same across the board and the restrictions that manufacturers are using, the tactics that they're using are similar across the board. Uh, so I would like to see a, a universal approach. Um, across US states, like California's right to repair bill this year was focused solely on medical equipment for hospitals, ventilators and and, and critical COVID equipment. Um, and, and the hospitals are being cut out of the mix the same thing, same way that the farmers are. Thank you. Um, I have a question, Kyle, from Scott Smith. Um, can you address the manufacturer's concerns over security and IP as reasons to prevent participation in repair? I think you did mention a little bit about that. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, so this is, I'm, I, I'm a software engineer. I have a lot of friends in the security community and the cybersecurity community, and they're really annoyed by this objection. Uh, and and they're, they're frustrated, like, not in our name are you going to use cybersecurity to restrict people's access to their hardware. Uh, the, the security experts that, that we work with say there's just absolutely no reason. Um, like, cybersecurity, you can design a product that's repairable and securable, and, and, and it's repairable and, and secure, uh, they're kind of orthogonal issues. They don't have a whole lot to do with each other. Um, it, this is, I think, an argument that has been dreamed up by, by lobbyists that are like scrambling for reasons to stop this. Um, in, in the US, in, in the state of Massachusetts, there was a recent right to repair ballot initiative where, where individual voters could, could vote their perspective on this issue. Uh, and, and it was around automotive, wireless access to data coming from your car. And it came down to a security debate where the, the auto manufacturers were saying it will be insecure if you can uh, access the data off your car. And they ran scare campaigns, they ran advertisements showing like someone tracking someone to their house with the information coming off of their car. And, and the rest of us are looking at that and saying, that's crazy. From a software perspective, so to put my, my software engineering hat on a little bit, this is a tactic that we call security via obscurity where the car is already transmitting wirelessly, the manufacturers are relying on some kind of secret information, a secret protocol that they've designed that's how the car communicates. Uh, a, a bad actor will reverse engineer that, that secure protocol and will be able to talk to it. So whether a consumer has access to the information or not, doesn't matter. Um, for a long time, locksmith didn't like people or talking, or lock manufacturers didn't like people talking about how to, how to you know, pick locks. It turns out locks get more secure when people know what the vulnerabilities are and, and then you know, in the open space we can we can innovate and we can iterate. Uh, so I would say to this one, uh, defer to your friendly neighborhood cybersecurity expert and they will happily uh, debunk the manufacturers because there is complete consensus in the in the computer security industry that right to repair uh, is actually uh, a benefit to improving the security of these devices by, by reducing the obscurity of these proprietary interfaces. Thanks, Kyle. Um, just a few comments. Um, there's, there's lots of comments coming through, and I'm, I'm trying to um, get through them. A couple of comments um, from John Deere, um, that they provide detailed product information, software solutions and parts, and a um, website is provided. But also um, a comment from someone saying that John Deere was one of the first key ag companies that actually met the right to repair deadline with customer tools and resources and um, the contributor would like to see that point corrected um, today. 
Uh, well, I would love for the person who asked that question to point me to where I can get that software for a John Deere tractor because John Deere has said that it's available, but we haven't found a single dealer that can sell, sell you that software. Um, what I've been told is that potentially there may be a $5,000 a year license available where you might be able to get access to a lightweight version of what John Deere calls service advisor. Um, but there is a big difference between what John Deere is talking about potentially allowing customers to do, even with this subscription access to the software and what th their technicians can do. And I'll give you a really good example. I'm in the farming community. Um, my friend Dan uh, called me panic a couple years ago and he said, hey, my, my tractor is down. This is a big 300 horsepower treaded track tractor. He spent over $300,000 on it. And the tractor would not start. It was throwing an error code, it wouldn't start. And it turned out the reason was that there was a sensor on the hydraulic track uh, that, that measures the, pre the pressure, the tension of the track, and the sensor had gone bad. The tractor was perfectly fine. There was nothing wrong with it. The sensor was bad. He wanted a way to be able to bypass that sensor so that he could farm while he waited for the, the part to be shipped to him. And, and by the time the part got to him, it was going to you know, dramatically reduce the yield on his harvest. And there was no way to be able to bypass that sensor. So one of the arguments that we'll hear from John Deere is they'll say, well, we support repair, but not modification. Well, there's not a whole lot of difference. Like he needed to make a short-term modification of that tractor to bypass the sensor so that he could he could harvest his, his equipment. And I can tell you, I have a tractor. I make modifications to my tractor all the time. Uh, what do you call a modification or repair? It's a fix. Uh, and that's, that's what farmers need to do. So I, I think we're seeing a, a lot of um, sort of, you know, false arguments by manufacturers. One argument that John Deere has been saying lately is, well, farmers can can do, like the only repairs that they need to do with electronics are like 2% of repairs, they can do all the rest. Well, since when do I only own 98% of my machine? Thanks, Carl. Um, Shane, there's actually a question here for you. Um, sorry, from Jesse Adamstein. Um, given Australia's reliance on imports for tech items, how could future manufacturing regulation play out in this context? It's a really good question, given how much we import and how much comes from overseas. And I think this is where partnerships with countries or blocks like the European Union and the United States are very important. But that's where also we need to keep up with those groups. If we're going to see these standards being set in other jurisdictions, there's no reason why we shouldn't be adopting them here as well. Uh, and so I think that's a a response that we should make to that. We, we cannot afford to be left behind. I think um, Kyle made some really good points around the carbon intensity of products as well. And if you think about where the climate change debate is going, I think this is also an important consideration. I am concerned about the possibility of Australia starting to be subjected to uh, trade barriers, uh, trade restrictions, trade penalties for the carbon intensity of our products. And so I think these two issues are quite closely tied together and there's scope to work on them uh, to some extent in parallel, certainly in terms of the rationale behind them. Thanks, Shane. Um, we now have another question um, in relation to, um, from Adrian Selleck. Um, have you had any feedback um, from the American Watchmakers Association, Carl, in the US? Because our watchmaking industry here in Australia has similar issues to the mobile phone industry? I have heard this from, from watchmakers in our area, uh, that they are increasingly having access to, uh, to, having challenges getting access to equipment. And by the way, just to kind of point out at a macro scale, watchmakers, I think is the only industry term where the term watchmaker applies to the repairer, but they're actually making manufacturing new parts. I have a wonderful friend here who's a watchmaker, and I ask him, hey, if you can't get a particular gear, what do you do? He's like, well, I'll make a wax mold, and I'll melt down some metal, and I'll make a new new gear. So watchmakers are incredibly sophisticated, incredibly talented people. Uh, but absolutely, they're, they're seeing challenges. Um, you know, one thing that I would be interested in, in working on, and that I think we have some ways to go with the legislation, is the reference legislation in the United States. Uh, is focus on products that have electronics. So if you have a purely mechanical product, the current US state reference legislation would not help watchmakers in that instance. And I think maybe there's an opportunity to improve uh, our approach. So I, I would welcome their, their involvement. I would say the watchmakers in the US have not been particularly involved, but, but we'd love to work with them. Thank you. Um, we have lots of questions from um, individual people about how to, um, what's, what do 
people think the best way to educate the broader community about repair and the right to repair. Um, Shane, that's probably for you as well. How do we, how do, we do this consumer awareness um, apart from holding events such as this? Oh, for me, that comes back to that question of market failure to an extent. Uh, we live in a complex world, people are busy. I think there is a role for regulators to step in and create these standards, and in doing so, uh, and I found Kyle's point around the uh, removal of those um, inaccurate stickers, an important part of it, there is a regulatory role to step in there and enable consumers to be empowered, uh, to make sure that they have the rights not everyone will know how to exercise them, but I think those things grow over time as well. But we first of all need to create the standard and the opportunity for people to have that ability. Thank you. And a, a question from Dr Sasha Alexander, who's a design academic. Do industrial designers, product designers require repairability on, the, on their interdisciplinary list of things to do and their extended product responsibility? Absolutely. Uh, I can't under, underscore how, enough how important the role of design is. Uh, we are living in a world where all the waste that we see around us is by design. It, it may be accident, you know, it, it, it may be a mistake, it may be bad design, but these products that are short-lived, uh, that's, that's uh, a nine and 10. I have here, this is an iMac. It's a gorgeously designed, aesthetically designed product, uh, but they decided to make it so thin um, that uh, you can't even put, fit a traditional USB port in it. Uh, and uh, the, the, it's so thin that they couldn't make the RAM upgradable, they couldn't make the storage upgradable. So when the flash memory fails on this computer, it's going to be a very beautiful piece of trash. Uh, so yes, we would like to see more um, designers factor this in. I think it should be a, a skill on the, on the CV of, of every industrial designer. Uh, and we're starting to see that more and more. I run design workshops uh, for industrial designers for uh, all kinds of large electronic companies and companies outside of, of uh, uh, the electronics industry. I, I work with apparel designers, work with outdoor gear uh, designers, uh, and it's something that really we, you have to factor in. And I'll bring them a product that's failed, and we'll sit down, we'll do a workshop, and we'll say, how can we design this? Not so it won't fail, but so it's easier to repair when it does fail. Uh, because uh, yeah, the, the second the law of thermodynamics is coming for us, right? Entropy breaks everything down eventually. Uh, we have to design uh, resilient systems, which means products that can be mended. Thanks, Carl. And um, just a quick comment from Erin. She wants to know where you got your T-shirt from. She loves it. <laughs> you can, australia.ifixit.com, you can get one. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and we've also had um, a question about um, whether people are able to obtain, um, sorry, I'll come to you a sec, um, whether to obtain a list of the registrants here today. Um, obviously, for privacy reasons, we didn't release that. But um, what we do plan to do, and this is for everyone online as well, is following this event, we intend to um, send a survey out to each of the registrants. And on that, you can provide consent for your information to be shared with other participants, um, if you so choose. And I'll speak a little bit more about that at the end of the day. We just have a, a question here in the audience, and I can repeat it for those online. Thank you. Um, for those online, if I can just capture that, it was about the service economy and how to improve that quickly because it's so important to society more generally. Yes. yes. Um, Shane, perhaps? You have reminded me of a point that I should have made in remarks, which is a very good one, is that the, the actual employment opportunity here. You know, we live in a world in which uh, blue-collar sector, particularly in Australia, is increasingly have been diminished. And I think there are a lot of people who are very skilled with their hands who are, you know, we, we undervalue trades. Uh, we, in this country, I think have a cultural push around going to university is the thing to achieve when in fact, uh, going to technical college, TAFE, CIT, whatever you call it in your jurisdiction is a really valuable thing and should be valued. And I think having a viable repair economy creates an employment pathway for people who's minds and hands are really good at doing those sort of things. So I think that's an interesting dynamic in there. So I, that's what I draw from your question and your comment. Oh, it's more um, referencing that. Yeah, sorry, for those online, the observation was that I perhaps missed an important part of the question, which is that uh, in the future, people won't necessarily own something, they will receive it as a service. Uh, and I think that is, you know, we see that trend perhaps in the transport sector. It's a likely future scenario. It raises really interesting questions for governments around 
the provision of parking, for example. There's really big questions in the service sector, but I'll perhaps see if Kyle wants to add a further comment on this. Yeah, this is a great question, uh, and we talk about this a lot in the context of the circular economy. The, the advantage of a service ecosystem like you're describing is it aligns the incentives. So the product designers want to make a product that will last as long as possible. We have these electric scooters taking over our cities here, and you, you, know, you scan the code on your phone, and then you can drive the scooter. And I've talked with uh, some of the design engineers at these companies, and they tell me the profitability of these scooter companies is dependent on how long they can make the thing last, how uh, fast they can make it serviceable. So that's cool. Um, on the other hand, I'm not sure I want to completely live in a post-ownership society. I like owning my computer. I don't want to rent my computer. Um, and there's, I like owning my bicycle. I don't want to rent my bicycle. So I think that we'll have a hybrid model, but I certainly think that the kind of strategies that you have where you're going to design something to be long-lasting, robust, durable, uh, because the manufacturing incentives are aligned, we need to find a way to do that same thing with consumer products that people own. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for um, posting questions. If you've had any technical problems, we'll, we'll try and address that in, in the break. Um, it's now 10.30, and we have a half an hour break um, for a morning tea break for those present. And for those of you online, we'll see you back here at 11 o'clock um, Australian Eastern Standard Time. Thank you very much. And thank you again to Shane and Kyle for your contributions. This is great.